All right, that should be us live. Welcome everybody, welcome, welcome. I'm Eric Edmeets and uh, I will be the host of this masterclass and I'm really, really excited to see you guys here. There's a, uh, I've been looking in the chat. I mean, we've got people from everywhere. One of my favorite things about being able to do this kind of communication these days is that it's green. I mean, nobody had to log any air miles to come out to this masterclass. So, hey, live events have their place. I certainly like doing that as well, but it's nice to be able to reach so many of you in so many different places. And check it out, we have somebody from Edmonton, which meant that I didn't have to go to Edmonton when it's minus 30 there. So, I mean, how perfect. Hey, Kelly, good to have you here. And uh, all right, so let's jump in with what today is all about and what you can get from it and how you can get the most out of it. So in essence, this masterclass is about really developing a career as a speaker, how to, how to have a fulfilling, and I mean emotionally and financially fulfilling career as a speaker. And, I, and I'm, I'm coming to this um, topic from the position of a person who was never comfortable with public speaking as, as uh, when I was younger. Um, and not only was I not comfortable with it, but I was... Uh, uh, decidedly uncomfortable with it. So I had to go through an incredible journey that went from overcoming my fears and then to, you know, developing some level of comfort and then to actually working on the skills. And then beyond working on the skills, working on the business of it. Um, and that's another, another flavor entirely. And we'll touch on all of those things today. And so in essence, what I want you to know is that wherever you are on the journey, whether you are currently suffering with absolute anxiety and terror about public speaking, or whether you are already super comfortable with it and you're looking for refinements, I've been on, wherever you're on the journey, I've been somewhere on that journey with you. And so I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this experience. Now, in order for you to get a lot of value out of the experience, one of the things that I want to share with you that I share at just about every workshop I do is some key principles to help you get the most out of this experience. Uh, any of you who have been to my live events or my online workshops in the past, you will know that um, one of the things that's absolutely key to me is that people actually take things away and take action and do stuff. I'm not interested. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be worth it to me to simply run workshops just so people can listen and, you know, develop some nice theories and then go back to their life and, and do things exactly the way they did before. So with that in mind, I'm going to do my bit to make this as engaging and powerful and effective for you as possible. And then your bit is this. A, be engaged with me. You'll notice that we didn't do this in traditional webinar format. We did this in mastermind format. So I can see you. <laughs> I can see you. And, and so what that mu means is, uh, is, is that I want you to be engaged. So for example, if I ask a question, then I want you to go ahead and answer it. If I ask you to raise your hands, how about this? Everybody who's willing to raise their hands, raise your hands. Look at that. It went really well. And so that's going to make a more classroom type environment. This is really important for a few reasons. Um, the one is, is that the more engaged you are in any content that you're consuming, the more likely it is for that content to actually embed itself. How many of you have ever found yourself scrolling through, you know, say Netflix and you find yourself watching a movie or a show and you get like half an hour into it and you're like, oh my God, I think I've watched this before. Anybody ever have that experience, right? That's because you weren't really engaged in the content. If you were truly engaged in the content and you've had other shows where you would never, you know from the poster that you've seen it before and that's because the content really engaged you. So one of the ways for you to be engaged is actually respond. So one of the ways of responding is to raise your hand or nod or allow your face to emote. You can do that. You can allow it to emote because I'm, look, you do this anyway. I've seen people watching their screens like watching a movie on their phone in the, in, the, in, the, in the airport and they smile and they emote and stuff. Well, you can do that here as well. The other thing you can do is talk in the chat. You can, you, can, you can talk in there and you can answer questions. So for example, I might ask a question like, where are you guys all from? I know many of you have already answered that, but you can just go ahead and flood the chat with information as to where you are from. And another way for you to be engaged is to ask questions. So at the tail end of this, we will be doing open Q&A. And frankly, I, um, the experience that I've had from people is they say, wow, I got a ton of great content, but it was the Q&A that really unlocked some stuff for me. And so I'll be answering anything you ask me 
preferably related to speaking this time around, but anything you ask me, I'll do the best I can to come up with a great answer for it. So engagement is absolutely gonna be key. We're even going to bribe you for a little engagement. We've got some business freedom water bottles that we're gonna give away at the end. We'll announce that and it'll be based on your level of engagement. That's how we'll choose how we give those away. By the way, they're awesome bottles. They're, they're, first of all, they look very cool. And secondly, they keep your water cold. And thirdly, they stop you needing to use con consume plastic to carry your water around. So there you go. All right, so that's where we're at. And um, I wanna be clear, just to make sure that you showed up at the right webinar. I mean, if you came here for the Real Estate Investing Summit, you're at the wrong webinar. But if you came here because you're really interested in building a career or, or building a brand that involves you as a person of influence, as a speaker, on camera or on stage, then you're definitely in the right place. If you're thinking that you'd love to get better influence on social media, using videos like on YouTube and Instagram and, and Facebook and these sorts of things, then you're definitely in the right place. And if you're feeling a little bit unclear about how to brand yourself as a speaker, again, you're in the right place. In, in essence, the bottom line is if you want to learn more about becoming a really effective communicator, whether it's in front of a live audience, one-on-one, -on -one, one to a 5,000, or whether it's on camera, the principles we're going to share with you are going to be valuable. So you're definitely in the right place. It, it, we're, we're going to talk a lot about how the industry works because there's many different models of being a speaker. We're going to talk about how the industry works and what are some of the things you can do to make sure you navigate your way through that. We're going to talk about really how you get booked as a speaker and, how, and, and, and by the way, what's more important than getting booked in a sense is getting rebooked and we'll talk about how to make that happen. And uh, we're going to talk about how to build a, a, a speaking community around you. That's a very key important part of, the, of becoming a speaker because frankly, life on the road as a speaker can be a little bit lonely. And that, and that means having a great community of other people that are traveling that road with you is really great because first of all, hey, you get to see them and be in, in places with them at the same time. But also it means that you can help each other grow your businesses. And that's a really key part of, of being an effective speaker. We're also going to work on how to build your stories and your brand. We're going to talk about what stories are, how you might use them, and then how you might uh, choose the stories you're going to use based on the overall brand promise that you're trying to create for who you are. I find this to be a fascinating topic because if any of you know me very well, you'll know that I have a somewhat confusing representation on brand because I like to speak about so many things. And I'll discuss how I've navigated that and how you could probably do a better job of it than I have by being a little bit focused on the mission that you're particularly interested in. And then of course, we'll talk about how to find the stages that you wanna be on and, and earn money as a speaker because there's many different models of that. You can get paid to speak, you can run your own workshops and sell tickets to them, you can go to workshops where you're paid to sell things and there's lots of different ways to make money as a speaker. So these are some of the things we'll cover today. Does this sound good so far? All right, cool. Um, just some logistics around the way the call is going to work. Um, we are going to uh, run for about 90 minutes and then we're going to do the, the open Q&A afterward. The way the Q&A will work is I'll definitely take some live interactive Q&A at the time. But if you have questions in the meantime, then I suggest, hey, pop them in here and, um, and the team will aggregate them and put them in a little uh, document that I have on the left screen over here so that I'll be able to run through those questions for you. So if you have questions as I'm going along, rather than attempting to distract me to answer the question right away, write the question in the chat. My team will grab it and aggregate the questions. That way also probably stop me from answering the same questions twice. So, all right. Now, the, uh, um, the next thing about it is, is that uh, you have a workbook that uh, you, hopefully you downloaded or you've got it on, on your screen. Um, hopefully you download it because we're going to want you to do some writing in there, but you don't have to write in the workbook. You can equally write in your journal. So there's different spots during this masterclass where I'll stop and I'll get you to think and, and I find that often people think better when they write their thoughts. They, they, they find themselves more, more focused that way. And that's why we've given you a workbook uh, um, to do this. And then at the end of this, uh, I will share some ideas um, about how I can continue to support you long out into your speaking career. And of course, we'll make the entire recording of this masterclass available for you for 48 hours afterward. Now, one last thing. If you feel like there are people here that should be here that have already missed the first five minutes and you really want them to be here, 
go ahead and right now, any of you, I, as a matter of fact, we'll give extra bonus points for water bottle uh, giveaways. Uh, if you go ahead and to somebody from my team, if you could share the link in the chat, go ahead and share this link and invite other people. Tell them it's live. It's happening now. Tell them not to miss out. Get engaged. All right. So let's have a look at your, how many of you actually, I'm curious because we want to know, hey, how to make these things better in the future. How many of you actually have your workbook? I want to know how many of you actually have it. Excellent. Good. Excellent. I feel awesome about that. Uh, that was an idea from somebody on our team to actually provide workbooks with these master classes. And so far, it seems to be going really, really well. Now, I want you to know, remember I said this, I, wherever you are in your speaking career, wherever you are in your speaking career, I was at that point, at some point. I, I, I just about guarantee it. I, uh, I know what it's like to be at the very beginning of it. And I, and I, I'm, I'm, let, let's just do a quick uh, survey here. I'm curious, how many of you uh, are currently already what you would consider to be a professional speaker? And let me define that before you raise your hand. A professional speaker is somebody who is either directly making money from speaking or indirectly making money from speaking. In other words, you have a business and you speak to go get clients and you do this on a regular basis. So how many of you are currently professionally speaking? Okay, it seems like a few and a couple of come see, come saw in the middle, right? Okay, and, and, and then how many of you are, uh, say, casually speaking, like you go to Toastmasters or you occasionally do a talk here or there, that, that kind of thing? How many of you are in that category? Okay, cool. And then how many of you are like, still not totally sure why, I'm kidding, but like how many of you are, you're not really a speaker, but you'd really like to be way more comfortable and effective as a speaker? How many of you are in that category? All right. And then how many of you are, you know, terrified, nervous, not even sure why you're here, don't know where to begin. And just like, you know, it makes you feel nauseous to even think about it, but you're here anyway. How many are in that category? All right. All right. So I am telling you again, I've been at every level of that, of that uh, chain. And so I want you to know that you are in the right place. You're in the right place and, and you're going to get some real tips today. They're going to help you move wherever you are on that timeline to move a little bit further down that timeline. So you're in the right place. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the speaking industry and the, the power of speaking. So the first thing I want to let you know is that speaking effectively, it's frankly the closest thing that we truly have to a superpower. I mean it. And, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But this is that you know, long before there was Netflix, people used to watch these little electronic boxes. I, some of you are old enough to remember. It was called a television. Remember them? And, and, and long before they, they had those little electronic television boxes, they had radios and people sat around and listened to the radio. No kidding, families gathered the chairs around and listened to the radio. But when I say long before, the fact of the matter is, is all of that happened in the last 30 seconds of human history because for the previous hundreds of thousands of years, arguably maybe even a couple of million years, people sat around the fire and they learned around the fire. Now, the very best way for people to learn is by doing something. But, you know, if you're three years old, you can't really go hunting. So the best way for you to learn about hunting before you're old enough to go is to listen to stories about hunting because then you do in your mind. And so for hundreds of thousands of years, we have received a huge amount of the content that we've meant to learn in our life through stories that have been put into us. And so our brain, it's basically built on that operating system. We really like stories. They're engaging for us. They help us to bring the content in. And when they're told really well, they help the content to stay in. And the other thing that happens is, is that when somebody is an effective storyteller, they create a magnetic attraction. They create a magnetic attraction that we call the stage effect. And the stage effect is a very powerful and almost unnatural, but except that it's completely natural type of attraction that somebody creates when they stand on stage, put themselves at risk and share valuable content. In fact, you could almost do it like this. The better quality their presentation is, which means that it's engaging and valuable, plus the size of the audience equals the amount of attraction they create. So if somebody's doing a pretty good conversation with 50 people watching, they create one level of attraction. But if they're doing an incredible presentation in front of 50 people, they create another level of attraction. And if they're doing an incredible presentation in front of 5,000 people, they create another level of attraction. Does this make sense to you all? 
This is very much the principle on why a nightclub will make people line up outside, even though there's nobody inside the nightclub yet, because the lineup is what's creating the attraction. Well, the audience, or in social media terms, the number of views, right? That's the audience, is creating a level of attraction. And, and if you doubt this at all, how many times have you had this situation? Somebody sends you a video, you look down, ah, it's only had about 30 views, not interested. But if it's had 3.4 million views, suddenly you're interested. If it's had 33 million views, suddenly you're interested. The size of the audience indicates to you that you should be paying attention. And so this is one of the reasons that speaking is such an incredible superpower because if you're any, how, by the way, I'm curious, how many of you consider yourself to be rather more introverted than extroverted? I'm curious, how many? Okay, so for those of you who are a little more introverted, this is like the ultimate life skill. Because if you're like me, I don't like going off to a conference and meeting all kinds of strange people. I just, it's just not interesting for me to walk up and inter But if I walk on stage and I, I give a really good presentation and I, I create attraction, then I'm not gonna need to meet anybody because they're gonna come and meet me. And this skill has completely changed my life just on that one basis. Now, the other thing about being a speaker, quite aside from just that, is that it's the ultimate portable business, isn't it? I mean, it's something you can do anywhere. You could, matter of fact, I'm sitting at home right now. I'm doing it right now. I, I'm here in my house. And, and I'm able to do this live when I travel around the world. I'm able to do this from where I am. What it means is, is that my business, my income is separate from my geography. And I've got to tell you something. I don't care what you, country you live in these days. Like I, these days, having your income separate from your geography is pretty cool. It just is. It's very nice to be able to say one day, you know what? I'd like to go live in Bali. How many of you would just love to maybe go live in Bali for a year? Anybody up for a year in Bali? Right. Well, that's one of the great advantages of becoming a speaker, author, you know, a, a person of influence because your value is you. And so your value is wherever you are. And so it's an incredibly, uh, um, it's an incredibly interesting career from that perspective because it's portable and it travels with you. So we're going to talk about how to build a business around that portability, how to get your foot in the door and, and, and really how to begin creating for yourself a real like tribe, how to be able to create for yourself who are the people that you're really talking to. Now, this is really key. What really makes a speaker is that people want to pay attention to that speaker. So in the same way that the audience is important relative to the attraction, in the same way that the audience is important relative to attraction, so is the following, right? Like, so if you know, I, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Jay Shetty, but I, I, Jay Shetty is a really neat guy. I got to meet him earlier this year and I've had a number of conversations with him about how he's been doing social media and it's phenomenal. Jay Shetty has something like 20 million followers on, on Facebook. So if he's doing a Facebook Live, there may be 5,000 people watching live, but you're also aware there are 20 million followers. He's got this tribe. And so beginning, now that's a little bit of an intimidating number. Most of them are oh, 20 million. How am I going to get there? Well, the first thing I'll point out to you is Jay started 18 months ago. Right? It's not like, like Tony Robbins who started 30 years ago. Jay Shetty started 18 months ago. We live in a time where this ability to communicate can speed up everything you want to create. And so a key part of that is determining ultimately who your followers need to be. Who is your audience? Who do you want to be speaking to? And, and that is really a, a key component to figuring out who you want to be as a speaker. Another reason for this is, as I said before, the speaker lifestyle can be a little lonely at times. And so having a tribe that you really love to spend time with is awesome because that means when you run your workshops, when you run retreats, when you go do a keynote presentation, when you're running online workshops or whatever the case might be, you're with people that you want to be with. And that's a really key aspect to building your own tribe. It's absolutely key because also those people that gather around you, that celebrate your message, that get excited about what you're sharing, they share it for you. Don't they? They go out and they tell the world about you. They tell the world what they learned from you. And, and so that's really a key component too of determining who your tribe is. Think about that. You know, you could choose a segment of the population to have as your target audience, but what if you weren't proud of that segment of the population? What if you didn't want those people 
talking about you, right? You want like some resonance with your tribe, your resonance with your followers, with your audience. And so it's really key that you work with that. And where does that begin? It really, it begins with you. It, it begins with, you know, why you want to do this. It really starts there. In fact, for those of you that are nervous of public speaking, I want to share something with you. You're not actually nervous at all. You're excited. Because the people who are truly afraid of public speaking, they don't even want to be a speaker. Think about that. The truth is you're not really nervous. You're just excited and a little uncertain. So excitement plus a little uncertainty and you feel nervous, but it's not nervous. It's not fear, right? And, and this is something fascinating. The more fear you feel, the more you want to do it. Isn't it true? Come on. Guys, <laughs> we're having a little technical fault. Somebody got very excited about that. But the point is, is that when somebody's like not at all afraid of public speaking, it's either because they're really comfortable with it or because they don't want to do it. But somebody who wants to do it has a little uncertainty, the fear, and the more they want to do it, the more the fear comes up right up until one day they realize that if they don't share their message, people are going to suffer. I want you to think about that. If, you're, if you have a really valuable message and you're letting your nervousness hold you back, how selfish is that? If you have a message that can actually solve people's problems, that can solve them and prevent them from experiencing pain, that can give them a better quality of life, many of them, but you're not taking the stage because you're afraid of your fear of public speaking, think about how selfish that is. And in a sense, that's in, in a very real sense, that's kind of what happened to me is one day, speaking about health, I hadn't done any public talks except around like the table, you know? And one day a friend of mine said, Eric, would you come and do a talk? Would you come and do a talk for, and I'm like, yeah, no problem. But I, it, the only reason I agreed to do it is six months away. I was so terrified. It, it, but because it was six months away, I thought, oh, well, I'll, you know, six months, it's far away in the future. I'm not afraid now. And you know what's crazy? A month before the event, I expected to be terrified and I wasn't. And a week before, I wasn't. And as I got in the car to drive from Bristol to Scotland, where I was going to do this talk, I still wasn't afraid. And then the first speaker went up. And in the intermission, I thought, that's where the fear will kick in. And it still didn't come. And it suddenly hit me that I was more afraid of letting the people down than I was of my silliness and fear of rejection. My why became so strong that I was absolutely prepared to put myself at risk and it no longer felt like a risk. I'll give you a silly or crazy example. Let's say you're in a room full of people and you notice there's a leak of water coming down the wall and it's dripping into the carpet and it's sort of, you know, there's like now there's like a, a centimeter or half an inch of water on the floor. If you're terrified of public speaking, if you're shy, you might tap on the person's shoulder next to you and go, hey, look, there's some water over here but you're not going to stand up and go, excuse me, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, I've noticed there's some water on the floor, right? You're not going to do that. But what if it was fire? You wouldn't be afraid of public speaking anymore, would you? You wouldn't be afraid at all. You'd be up and, hey, fire! Everybody, you'd be there. What I want to suggest to you is that when you get clear enough about your why, it's like that. When you get clear enough about what your message is, why you want to help people, what message you want to share, what impact you want to have, the stronger that why, the easier it is to overcome the fear and the nervousness. Does this make sense to you guys? This is really key because the clearer you get about why you want to do this, the clearer you are about, you're getting about who you are. And the clearer you are about who you are, see, now the easier it starts to become to figure out who it is that you're going to be bringing along on the journey with you. The fact of the matter is, is there are a ton of fake it till you make it speakers out there, but then there are a few who absolutely follow their why and they are who they are. They wake up one day, something happens in their life and it creates a circumstance where they absolutely want to create a change. And then they live that way. You know, we've got a quote here, or one of my favorite quotes from Simon, Simon Sinek, people don't, do, don't buy what you do. They, they, they buy why you do it. And, and, you know, this is a really key thing. If you, take a look at, um, if you take a look at somebody like Michelle Obama, look, irrespective of your politics, this is clearly a woman who cares a great deal about the rights of girls and the rights of women to be equally educated, to have equal opportunities in employment and to be freed from slavery and all this kind of stuff. It's a massive burning why for her. You don't question it. You just know that it is. You know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, 
he, from a very young age, just absolutely got off on making people laugh. It was, just, it was what, <coughs> excuse me, it's what, it's what juiced him. It's what made him operate. And that's clearly, I think, affected his direction and his career and the type of speaking that he does. And so what is your why? What is that about? Who, what is it that you really want to be talking about? So what I'd love you to do is I want you to just take a minute and I want you to think about your why. If you were to achieve everything that you wanted to achieve as a speaker, what would the impact of that be on other people, on you? And what I'd love for you to do is open up your workbook and there's a page right in there where you could just write a little bit about what is your why. Now, remember, I believe that first your why should be about you. So I'm, I'm happy for you to get a little selfish. Here are some really great whys. How many of you would like to fly routinely in business class and have other people pay for it? Anybody up for that? Anybody, anybody, anybody? That happens to me all the time. I like that. I'm, I'm up for that as a why. And so when you talk about your why about becoming a speaker, I think the first thing you should do is think about the why for you. And maybe that sounds selfish to some of you and maybe it is. But I'm going to go with the very, best personal, uh, the, the very best personal development advice you ever received. You didn't buy it on DVD. You didn't sign up for a master class. You didn't go to a week-long workshop. You didn't walk on fire with Tony Robbins. The very best personal development advice you ever got, you got on a plane when they came on and said, in case of a cabin depressurization, please put your own oxygen mask on before you help others. That's it. The best personal development advice you'll ever get. And so the first why I want you to think about is what's in it for you. And then, then I want you to think about the bigger why. The bigger why that drives you to want to do these things. Now, I know some of you, you're like, oh, but Eric, it's not really for me. I just want to go do this for other people. That's fine. I just want you to benefit too. So take a few minutes. And if any of you want to share it here in the chat as well, that'd be great. But just take a couple of minutes. And in your, um, uh, in your uh, workbook, just take a couple of notes about what your why is. And I will give you a couple of minutes to make that happen. Go for it. Now, as we kind of, I'm going to give you another minute here, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go further. What I mean by further is one day, long before WildFit started to take off the way it has, for many of you might know that WildFit is a company I started about five years ago, and it, it's just growing really beautifully all over the world. And long before I really launched it in a big way, I was talking to a group of, of clients at our Business Freedom Experience, a five-day business school program that I run. And the students asked me at some point, we were talking about getting clear about your goals. And one of the things I'd shared with them is, is that people are much more likely to invest or want to work with you if they feel like you have really big goals. So if you, for example, say, oh, well, you know, my goal is to, um, you know, feed a hundred, a hundred homeless people, then you might get a few friends go, yeah, let me, let me, let me see what I can do to help you with that. 
But if you do like Tony Robbins did and he stood up and he said, we're going to feed 100 million homeless people, right? Like 100 million people in need. Suddenly that's a really big number, which by the way, as of today, he upgraded to 1 billion because they crossed the 100 million mark, right? And so when the number's really big, people get really excited about that. And so what I want you to do is to think about that because what happened in my case was after sharing this with the students, the students did this thing that I hate when students do to me, but they took my stuff and gave it back to me. And they go, well, Eric, we've noticed this wild fit thing seems like a bit of a hobby to you, but you seem pretty passionate about it. How many lives do you want to improve? And I hadn't really thought about it before. And, and then my, my, my deeper self, my higher self answered on my behalf and said, I want to radically improve the quality of life of a billion people on earth by improving their relationship with food. And the audience stood up and gave me a standing ovation because of the magnitude of it. And so here's the thing I want you to know. You have already achieved impossible things. Isn't it true? Come on, how many of you have achieved things that the younger you thought was impossible, completely impossible? All right, so when did you give up on that? Right, don't we at some point we get old, oh no, no, that's impossible. Wait a minute, when you were a kid, impossible was nothing. So what, what is impossible now? It's still nothing. Impossible is a frame of belief in the current moment. And all it takes is a little bit of a shift and suddenly what was impossible becomes possible. So now what I want you to think about is if the impossible was possible for you, why do this? What is the magnitude of the maximum impact you could really have if everything lined up really well one day? If one day you got the call from Oprah or you got the call from the, you know, a major network or Netflix called you and said, we need to have a series. Like what, what could happen? What is the major why? If you could really get your message out there to the maximum number of people, what's the impact that you would like to have? I'm gonna give you another 90 seconds. All right, by the way, does that feel nice? Yeah, does it feel, it does. And listen, I know that there's a, that for some of you, there's a part of you going, yeah, you wrote that stuff, but really, that's okay. The inner critic is meant to be there. The inner critic is meant to be there. And then you're supposed to argue with the inner critic. The difference is you're supposed to win over the inner critic. So it's okay that you have that. But the main thing is, doesn't it feel nice to play? Wouldn't it be nice if all this stuff could happen? So. So now let's talk a little bit about where stories come from. You see, very often people show up at our, at our speaking academy, our live speaking academy events, and they show up there and they go, you know, Eric, I don't, I don't have any stories. I don't know where I'm supposed to get them. And I assure them, you have plenty of stories. You just haven't started looking for them yet. And once I show you that you have plenty of them, you'll realize that you have more stories than you could possibly document and that you are accumulating stories every single day. And so let me, let me make this clear to you. Any experience you have had that resulted in an emotional response is a story. Isn't it? Any experience you've ever had that resulted in an emotional response was a story. Now, it doesn't mean it was a useful story. It doesn't mean it's a story you'd ever use on stage, but it's a starting point. Now, what I like to do once I've noticed that I'm living in some kind of a story is I very much like to catalog them and write them down because by keeping them in a story journal, I'm not trusting my memory with them. 
Now guys, like how many of you have ever had a really, you know, you've remembered something or there's this great joke or a story or a great idea. You were driving along in the car, you had the idea and then 15 minutes later you go back to think about and it's gone. Anybody had this? Look, notice young people, it's not just us with the gray hair that are raising our hands, it's all of us. It's not, it, this is not a senior thing, this is a thing thing. And, and so your, your memory isn't designed to store meandering thoughts that you've had. It's meant to store experiences that have had deep and intensive emotional experiences. So you remembering a story isn't good enough. You've got to document it, write it down. So you put it in your story journal. And, and, and by the way, I don't recommend writing out the story properly. I saw somebody already, I'm sure it'll come up in the Q&A, but like, should we write our entire talks out word for word? No, never do that. Not ever. Two reasons. One is, is that you will end up sounding like you wrote it all down. You've all heard the speaker that does that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'll be giving you a presentation that I carefully constructed and wrote down earlier in my hotel room. You'll be able to notice that because every sentence I speak will be complete. The punctuation will be clear. And I will continue to speak in these complete, I mean, nobody talks like that, <laughs> right? But when you write your stories out, you, 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 pre-frame yourself to speak the way you wrote it. The other thing is, is that when you write it out, you start asking your mind to remember the words and punctuation, not the story. By the way, how much harder, I want you to think about this. How many of you have a story about the first time you did something, maybe it involved somebody else, and you were a little bit nervous about it, and it was scary and you didn't know how the other person was gonna react and you didn't know how any of it was gonna go. How many of you have an experience like that in your life? It's easy to remember it, yes? But if I asked you to write a 1,000 word essay, how hard would it be to remember the 1,000 words in the correct order compared to just remembering the experience? Do you understand the problem? Most of you, most of you at some point in time and all the people out there, they go, oh, I'm afraid of public speaking sometimes because I'm afraid I'm going to forget what I had to say. Yeah, because you're trying to remember a thousand words instead of one picture. So no, we don't write the story out. We write bullet points just to remind us of the key influences of the story. The key, where was I? Who was I with? Roughly what happened? What was the weather like that day? We write out the bullet points so that in a glance moment, we can open up our story journal and then we can very quickly recall the story. Does this make sense to you guys? Now, here's the other thing. Here's a triple bonus of being a speaker. You begin to realize that as the speaker, you're living in a movie and you're the star of the movie. Everybody else is supporting actors. So right now, I am in your movie. I'm a supporting actor in your movie, right? And everything that's happening around you is a story. And what's really crazy is, is that while you aren't the one writing the ultimate script, like the things that are happening around you, you are the director that's telling the actor what to do with that stuff. And so here's one of the crazy things. Once you begin to realize that you are a story inventory keeper, that you're constantly trying to co collect stories that you can use on stage, you're going to notice that something happens to you and it's not like pleasant, right? <laughs> you're not liking it. And then, and then you're going to go, yeah, but I might want to share this story one day. So how do I want it to end? And you're going to end the story better simply because you become a speaker. If you want to know why so many speakers seem to live really fun and cool lives, it's because being a storyteller makes you accountable. I'm going to give you a crazy example. A couple of weeks ago, I organized my, my wife, Elise, her birthday is on December 31st. And so I organized a really special trip for her where we were going to fly from home to San Diego. We were going to go to a really cool New Year's Eve party with some very cool friends of ours. Then we were going to go hang out with some more cool friends of ours. Then we were going to go in to drive up to Los Angeles and have dinner with a, with a, with a super, super good friend of ours, a super famous actress and a really great friend of ours. And then we're going to fly home all in like 48 hours. It's going to be a special trip. And as we get out there, we get to the plane and our plane is delayed. So we know that our connection is going to be tight. We get to Newark Airport. Now, if any of you have been to Newark Airport, it makes me wonder why America calls itself a first world country because I've been to Newark Airport and I've also been to Changi Airport in Singapore and that makes me think that Newark is not a first world country airport. It's difficult sometimes in there. And you know what? I, we've got 19 minutes to get our connecting flight. And if we miss the connecting flight, let me tell you the impact of this. First of all, we only have a 40 hour trip. So if we miss this flight, we end up, 
it ruins the whole trip. Secondly, we had lie flat beds flying from Newark to San Diego. We don't want to miss this flight but 19 minutes. Now I have global entry. So I send Elise and she goes off. It's her idea. She goes, I'll go, I'll go to the gate. You clear the bags through customs because you've got global entry. It'll be faster. So I do all that. And then I clear the bags and I, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I, I get to the place where I have to drop the bags off and I hand the bags over to the guy. He has to scan them and put them on the belt. He scans them and they come up red and he goes, no, not loading them. What, 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 what do you mean? You're not loading them. And he goes, yeah, the connection's too tight. You're never going to make it. I go, look, I come through this airport almost every week. I definitely can make it. My wife's already on the plane. It's her birthday. Please, please, guy, if the bags don't make it, I'm okay with that. And he goes, nope, regulations are regulations. And I'm like, I'm at a loss. And I, I know that he's just being difficult. I've had tight connections like this before. He's just being difficult. And so I go over to the desk and the guys at the desk, they go, yeah, he should take your bag. And I go over and I'm like, and the manager comes with me and he says, take the guys, this guy still won't take it. Now there's a lot more to this story, but the short version is he gets a call from his supervisor. Supervisor demands that he takes the bag. The captain of the plane is holding the plane for us. No kidding. And the guy finally reluctantly agrees to take my bags. And I am so angry with him that all I want to do is I want to say something like, I told you so, you little blah, 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 whatever. I just wanted to. But you know what, though? I was in a story. And I have to control how the story's going to end. And so instead, I looked at him warmly, knowing that he was working on New Year's Eve night or the night, New Year's night before. And I said, I'm sorry for the trouble. Thank you so very much. And I walked on. And I got to tell you, the me of 10 years ago would never have done. I would have been indignant and difficult. So I want you to know that you are a story collector. And if you're in an event that is causing you an emotion, positive or negative, you are in a story. And now you have the ability to determine how the story is going to end. You can't control necessarily the external stuff, but you can control your response. And then when you're done with the story, you come along to your story journal and you write out the bullet points of the story. You don't know how you're going to use it, but you're going to use it one day. Now, the question is, once you've got lots of stories in your story journal, how do you choose which ones to use? Well, let's back up for a minute. I want you to think about this. When you have a journal full of stories and somebody spontaneously says, Sandra, Chris, Lucas, Phyllis, can you go on stage right now? I need you to go on stage right now. The other speaker didn't make it. I need, you have five minutes to prepare. Well, when you have a story journal, it's easy to do that. It's super easy. You just take a look and go, well, they want me to be on stage for 15 minutes. I go through my story journal. There are five stories I can tell, three minutes each, and boom. I'm oversimplifying it right now, but it actually is that simple. So now the question is, how do you choose the stories? Well, one of the most powerful things that we, one of the most powerful workshops, exercises that we do in our speaking academy is we talk about something called strategic outcomes. We talk about strategic outcomes because what's happening when you're deciding about your story is you're making a decision about, hey, what ultimately do I want to achieve when I'm here on stage? See, most speakers, they have a very limited set of strategic outcomes ranging from to survive the experience. <laughs> There's somebody like, if I could just get through it, that would be enough. Other people are like, I don't know, to finish my talk. Other people are like, I don't know, to sell something, to sell my book, right? They usually have like, or, or, you know, to entertain the audience because I'm getting my keynote fee and that sort of stuff. And so what we're really getting at is that when you get really clear about your strategic outcome, when you get really clear about why you're there, remember this goes back to your why, it goes back to ultimately what you want to achieve, but then it also goes to some of the other stuff. So here's an example. When I'm going on stage, I know that one of my strategic ob objectives generally is to get rebooked at the same conference, okay? Uh, another strategic objective is to attract social media attention and following. Another one might be to, uh, to get some really good quality photographs and video of the talk. I am thinking about these strategic outcomes before I even take the stage. And then because I'm getting really clear about that, then what's happening is, is that I get really clear about which stories to use, what clothes to wear, and how I'm going to tell my stories. Does this make sense to you guys? 
I don't want to oversimplify this. I really want you to get that when you know your why, ultimately that's your largest strategic outcome. And then when you start thinking about some of the other things that you want to achieve on stage, it really helps you to select your stories and how you're going to tell them. Very simple example of this is that when you get really popular as a speaker, and if you're particularly good on stage, people will actually become slightly afraid of you. No kidding. I know this happens to me all the time. People come up and go, oh, Eric, I had to work up all this courage to come and talk to you. I'm like, I'm like the most approachable guy in the world. Why would you have to do that? Well, because of the stage effect. It creates a lot of attraction, but it also creates some fear. So I noticed something that was happening is I was trying to get a lot more press coverage and blog interviews and podcast interviews. These days, it's super easy. I get them all the time, but I was trying to get them initially. But I'd go on stage and I'd be so effective that people wouldn't come and talk to me. And so I added to my strategic outcomes list, I want to get more media interviews. So then what happens? I tell a story about one time I was doing a talk and I usually built a little, I, I said, you know, I got to Stockholm and I usually build a day or two in for media interviews and podcasts after my talks. And so I did this talk with this one. It's a true story. I told the story. And immediately after telling that story on stage, who comes up to me after the talk? All the podcasters and bloggers, right? Just because I slipped in a 15 second story. So when you get clear about your strategic outcomes, things get a whole lot better. All of this is part of your overall brand delivery. Your ultimate why, that is what's your message, what's your mission, what is it you want to have an impact on, and then some of the tactical strategic outcomes that you want to have. So what I want you to think about right now is, and remember, this is a workshop. It doesn't mean you have to have the final answer right now. But the exercise I want you to do right now is, I want you to think about some words that you think relate to your brand. Now, before you do this exercise, some of you know me quite well. I see, um, I see Pale Bo, it's good to see you. Eric Kreebel, I, see, I, I know some of you know me quite well. Magnus, I see you there. And there are some of you who, you know, a friend invited you here and you don't know me, but, but let's just do this. I want you to write in the chat, what are some of the words that you think are part of my brand delivery? What are some of the words? Let's just see what people think. What are some of the words? Not like a whole mission statement, just some of the words. Family, freedom, inspiration, authentic, fun, storytelling, inclusive, humanist, approachable, fun, authentic, energy. You, there you go. You can see a bit of a frequency. You see the word freedom coming up quite often. You see the word authentic coming up quite often. You see the word family coming up quite often. These things are key within the brand delivery that I've been creating. So now I want you to do the same exercise for you. You're going to do the same exercise. So get your, 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 your workbook out. And what you're going to do is you're going to write down, you know, five or 10 words that you believe are a frequency match for who you are and your brand delivery. Go ahead and do it now. All right, now I want to add a little bonus thought for you in here. I want, to, um, I want to add a little bonus thought for you. Just take a look at your list and if you could only keep three of the words, circle those. If you could only keep three of the words, circle those. Just 30 seconds, quick.
All right, that's excellent. Now, why does this matter? This matters because it sets the tone for all of your communication. What I want you to think about from now onwards when you post on social media is, are these words represented? Are they represented? Are, are your social media posts a frequency match for the brand that you're trying to build? We had a meeting about a year and a half ago trying to figure out what was the brand, the ultimate brand word, the single brand word for WildFit. I think many of you now know what it is, either because you've heard it from me or you just can tell. But ultimately, we sat down and we determined that where Coca-Cola feels like they own happiness and Harley Davidson owns irreverence, we wanted to know, hey, what does WildFit stand for? And of course, what we determined is that one of the key brand promises of WildFit was freedom. Freedom to eat what you want, when you want, when you want to eat it, because you want to eat the right stuff. No kidding, the very next morning, we, we, by the way, this meeting was held with uh, Andrea, uh, uh, who's running WildFit, and Jeffrey Perlman, who was one of the founders of Zumba, you know, just one of the most successful fitness brands in the history of the world. People actually tattoo the Zumba logo on themselves. So he knows a thing or two about brand delivery. And so that, more, that evening we had that meeting and the very next morning we sat in the cafeteria and a man walked out, walked up to me and thanked me, walked up and he goes, you're Eric from WildFit. I go, yeah. And he goes, I just want to thank you. And we said, what for? And he said, for my freedom. It, was, it couldn't have been set up any better. But once we recognized that that was the way it was, we started changing the way we coached. We started changing the way we marketed because freedom had to become clear all the way through the way that we communicated with people. As an example, in the WildFit Challenge, if you did version one of it, you would remember that we used to have um, Enhancement Friday. Like we'd announce enhancements on Friday, but now we talk about Freedom Friday because this is the day you become free of this thing, right? It changed our brand delivery. So when you go on social media, what I really want you to think about is social media is today's version of the ultimate business card. And, and I want you to be you. So the clearer you are about you and the brand delivery that you want to create, the, the easier it is for you to be yourself on social media. So avoid some of the typical mistakes that you see on social media where people try to pretend to be something they're not. Uh, one of the things that drives me crazy is, uh, you know, uh, using photographs that don't represent them. Look, we all change over time. I know I can't help that there are pictures of me online from 20 years ago. That, that's fine. I don't use them in my present day marketing though because the last thing I want to do is show up at a meeting and go, oh, oh, hi. <laughs> you know, and I've seen this frequently. So in the same way, you, you, you wouldn't use a false picture of yourself and you shouldn't use a false. Look, you can have a picture. It, it's the, the best possible version of you. But if you're not showing up that way in life, then that's going to create an incongruency the same thing is true of what you write in your social media. You understand? Guys, think about this. Again, it comes down to the story thing. I'm out in the world, and if I have a bad customer service experience, here's one thing that I know. It happens to me every week that people walk up to me and go, oh my God, look, it's Eric from WildFit. In airports all around the world. It happened to me on the beach in Cancun two weeks ago. People walked up to me on the beach. That means that if I'm having a bad customer service experience, I, I'm not allowed to have a temper tantrum because you know damn well that if I have a temper tantrum, somebody's going to write about that stuff. You know, I have to be who I really am, which means even when I'm tired, even when I've had a rough day. And so what I want to suggest to you is you really want to be yourself in social media. Don't misrepresent yourself. Be the real higher purpose you. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about Think of social media as your first kind of opportunity to communicate en masse. You can communicate in written form, in photographic form, and of course in videos. You can communicate in pre-recorded videos that you edit and you put online, and you can communicate in live videos. All of that is excellent, and there's something special about a live audience. In fact, I would tell you that if you hone your skills in front of a live audience, that will make you even better on camera. People who hone their skills in front of a camera do not necessarily translate well into front of a live audience. So I want you to think about where are some of the opportunities that you have for getting out and getting yourself some stage practice. Now I know some of you are already speaking regularly and some of you have yet to do a talk. So I'm gonna give you some examples of this. At the most basic end, you have something like Toastmasters where you can just go and practice your speaking. Don't go to Toastmasters thinking they're gonna teach you to become a professional speaker. They're not, they're about professional speaking. They're about uh, amateur speaking, but it's a great place to practice. 
There are also like rotary clubs and that kind of stuff. But you can also, you can find lots of companies locally will have like lunch and learn, uh, um, lunch and wor learn workshops where you can write to them and say, hey, this is my message. I'd like to come and share it with your team. And so there are lots of opportunities for you to get out there and practice and get known as a speaker. You know, I don't think that you need 10,000 hours to become a great speaker to use the old Malcolm Gladwell idea. I don't think so. You do need some. Every bit of practice you have telling a story is going to make you better and better, and it's going to help you develop your brand. I will tell you, it's very rare for me to go and do a talk in front of any size of people, and it does not lead to the next booking, right? That's what you want. And so when you agree to go do a lunch and learn for this workshop here, you go and speak at a Lions Club or a Rotary Club over there, or you even go to a local Toastmasters. If you kick butt and you're really good, then it's likely going to end up being in more referrals for you. So what do you do? Well, recognize that there are organizations out there that are looking for content all the time. There are clubs, organizations, there are you know, fitness studios. How many of you guys are interested in speaking in the kind of health and wellness space? How many of you are in that space? Great. Go and find local community centers and yoga centers and gyms and say, hey, I'd like to come and do a talk here. The worst thing they can do is say, we don't do that. And the best thing they can do is say, sure, we'll put it up on the bulletin board. Let's make it happen. So really like figure out who those organizations are, but then also try to figure out who the decision maker is, right? You don't necessarily want to offer to come and do a talk at the local yoga studio to the local yoga teacher. You might want to talk to the manager. And then you want to remember something really key. Anytime you're trying to influence somebody, know what's important to them. So for example, if I wanted to get booked to speak at a local gym, I would walk up to the manager and say, you know what? I would love to come and do a talk here. And I'll bet you by the end of my talk, lots of people will spend more time in the gym and they'll be more likely to renew their gym memberships. Do you think he's going to let me do the talk? If I want to go and do a talk at a company, let's say I want to do a talk at a company, I'm going to walk in there and go, hey, I see you guys have lunch and learn sessions. I'm going to share some information with your team that's going to make sure that they stop procrastinating, that they really take action, and that they become really awesome team players so that they'll stay working for you for a lot longer. Are they going to like that? You understand my point. The idea here is identify who the, who, who the decision maker is and speak to them and their values about why they want to have you there. So let's start with that. Let's do a little workshop right now. Where are some of the places that you could get practice? Now, some of you are going to go, I don't have any places. I don't know where I could go. That's really easy. Write Toastmasters. Just get, this, get the stream of consciousness flowing. Start with Toastmasters. Anyone can go practice at Toastmasters. Then there's like Lions Club and, 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 and Rotary Club. And then, you know what? There, there are like, um, you know, assisted care living homes, old, old uh, you know, retirement homes where they'd be like, they'd love to have you come and do a talk for practice sake. Then you can go up a level and go, what about, you know, gyms and community centers? So I'm going to give you about three minutes and I'd love for you to put, make sure you put some in your workbook, but I'd like you to share some in the notes so that people can crowdsource. You're going to have an idea that somebody else didn't have. So go ahead. Where are some of the organizations and places where you can practice and start getting yourself known as a speaker? If you are already a speaker, stretch some. And where are some of the places that you haven't gotten yourself on the stage yet? And write those ones down. All right, now I wouldn't be any good if I didn't say what I'm about to say to you, but I want you to look at that list and I want you to decide it's Tuesday. Circle one, that you are absolutely going to take steps toward getting yourself booked to speak there. 
Just circle the one that you're going to start working on this week. It doesn't mean you have to call them this week. It means you have to start doing your research this week. So if you're starting very basic and you say, I'm going to go to Toastmasters and you circle that and you research where your local Toastmasters club. But if you've said, hey, there's a local company here that I know does lunch and learn exercises, then you circle the name of that company and you start doing your research. Circle the one that you are going to start taking action on this week. Circle it now. If you don't know which one to circle, then just close your eyes and let the pen drop and circle the one that you touch. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the different types of speaking that there are because, um, you know, there's like keynote speaking and there's training and there's workshop speaking and, and all this sort of stuff. One of the things I really like to do when I'm working with, with clients is, especially when I'm teaching speaking, is I like to teach the most, the skills that translate most across everything. Does that make sense? So, you know, for example, uh, in our speaking academy, we spend a lot of time working on very short stories. And sometimes they'll go, Eric, I want, I want to do like a 30 minute story. And why are you making me practice with a three minute story? And I'm going, well, I could teach you how to tell a really compelling 30 minute story, but that would not make you good at telling five minute stories. But if I teach you how to tell really compelling three minute stories, that'll teach you how to tell a 30 minute story, a one hour story, a 12 hour story. You see the skills that are required to condense translate not necessarily the other way around. Well, what I want to suggest to you is that when you're constructing any kind of a talk, having a theme of a bit of a workshop style to it is a really great way to think, whether you're doing a keynote or simply delivering a, a presentation or whether you're training people. And so when you're, when you're working to set up a talk, what I want you to think about is, hey, the, the goal of this thing is to, is to educate, right? So what specifically do you want them to learn? So this is really a nice little exercise you do where you just simply write down, okay, these are some facts I would like them to have. I would like them to have these facts. Then, then you take a look and go, all right, what can I have them do? What can I have them do in their mind or in their body or with a partner that's going to help them get these facts in? Remember, they can do with their mind because if you tell a really great story that engages them in the fact, they're going to remember it. And then the question is, if you're talking about now wanting to like engage them to take action with you, you may, you maybe want them to come to a workshop of yours or to buy a book of yours or to engage you for some consulting or coaching. How many of you would like to do a talk that then engages people to come and do more business with you? Right. So the first clue to that is, is that you have to think to yourself, I have to give them more value in this presentation than they were expecting. You have to over deliver, right? But then when you've over delivered, what you really want to do is create an opening for them to know that you're ready to over deliver for them again. And, and I think what's really excellent about that is, you know, making sure that you, you um, let me just think about this is that like, if you're talking about, let's do this two levels. Let's say you're talking about a company. So you've gone to the, you've gone to the man, to the manager and you've said, Hey, I want to come to this talk. It's going to increase productivity and, 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 and extend employee loyalty so that they work for you for a lot longer. So that's excellent. You've kind of, you, you've made that original pitch, but the question is, have you made the pitch compelling enough for that person to take action? Well, I think that what you want to do is not just simply make that pitch, but share some of the information that's really going to matter that's going to show that you know what's going on. In other words, give him some, him or her some value right now and then be proactive. Follow up within 24 hours. You go back to them and go, hey, I'm just following up on the original conversation. I had to see if you have any questions, not to see if you're going to book me, to see if you have any questions. And then I would use a very similar principle stage with you exactly what it is you wanted to teach them. You've thought about the exercises, the stories you're going to use to get that information in their head and then create a feedback loop where you have the opportunity. You can say to them, Hey, by the way, guys, I'm going to be like sharing some more tips on my Instagram profile over the next 24 hours. Right. Or there's a book, an ebook you can come download off my website. It's available at this link. And then you can write back to them and say, Hey, I'm glad you downloaded this and you keep a level of engagement constantly seeking to create value for them. And when it's allowed, not every conference, it's okay for you to be pulling the emails and stuff, but when it's allowed, having a nice giveaway. Would you like a copy of my slides? Send me an email here. Would you like a copy of my ebook? Do this. If you'd like to come to a follow-up webinar for free, then submit your email here and begin building your email list and immediately touch base with them. As soon as they, like the minute they engage with you, Boom, you're right back at them with an auto response or a custom written message that makes them feel like you're adding more value each step of the way. The, the, the key thing, as I've already said here, if you want to know like 
really the real truth about getting booked and booked and booked again is deliver, deliver, deliver. If you consistently deliver more value than they're expecting, then you're going to consistently get yourself booked again and again and again. Simply be so good they can't ignore you. When you're putting together a general sort of one hour presentation, what I want to suggest to you is that you give some thought to some key components. In our speaking academy, we teach something called an F15, which is the beginning of your presentation. And the reason we call it an F-15 is because it's kind of like the first 15%, but also it's a metaphor for the F-15 fighter plane because if F-15 fighter plane uses more of its fuel on, on the takeoff than it does on a short, on a short sortie, like it, it's incredible. It uses like half of its fuel just to get in the air. And what I want to suggest to you is that you should be thinking the same way. The first bit of your presentation, the first part, the launch should be clinical. It should be rehearsed. It should be really solid. It should have a built-in laugh that predictable that you absolutely know that it's going to work. Really fabulous. That's what that initial introduction should be is scientific. Then what you want to do is go into your sort of general content. And I want you to think of your content. Imagine you drew a pie chart and you could measure the pie chart based on lecture time and story time. My question is what percentage do you think it should be? What percentage should be lecture time? What percentage do you think should be story time? Give me some comments here. What do you guys think? What percentage is information and what percentage is experience? Yeah, that's interesting. Some varying ideas, but it looks like there's a lot of consistency here around. And there's few people saying it should be 50-50. What I'm going to put to you is I think that it should be in the realm of 20 to 80 or maybe 30 to 70. It should be the majority should be story that is anchoring in the content that you're creating. And so when you think of that middle section, it really should be peppered with engaging, entertaining stories that really help lock. Remember this, emotion is the glue that causes memories to stick. So if you give people information without any emotional experience, no memory. But if you give people information and you anchor it in with an emotional experience, then there's memory. So we wanna make sure we do that. Then. You have to make a decision whether you want to do Q&A. Q&A is an art form. It really is. And if you would like to get good at Q&A, let me teach you one black belt skill. Are you guys ready for a total black belt skill for Q&A? Somebody asks you a question you don't know the answer to. That's what we're most afraid of in Q&A. They ask a question we just don't know the answer to, right? All right. Now, you might want to write this down. This is what you do. They've asked you a question you don't know the answer to. You write, I don't know. Just write, I don't know. I'll get back to you. Let me, that's a really good question. I don't know. But do not make anything up. Don't find yourself talking yourself into some answer that you've made up or that you're unsure of. You either say, I don't know, or you say, well, I don't know, but I have a theory. I have an idea. Or you say, I don't know, and you go find out for them and get them the answer. Or if you want to be really strategic, you go, I don't know, but I will find the answer and I will post it on my Instagram account later today. Oh, look, more followers, right? This is how you handle Q&A. First of all, be knowledgeable about your topic is how you handle Q&A. But when you don't know the answer, you just say you don't know. And the weirdest thing is once you give yourself permission to do that, Q&A will become a lot more comfortable for you. And then I highly recommend that you put a lot of focus into your L15. And that is how you're going to land the plane. And you should really know how you're going to land it because I'll tell you that ending on time is incredibly important. You should always end your presentations on time. And so when you have a really solid L15, when you really know you're landing, it's a lot easier to, to land on time, to, to end on time. And so what should be in that landing? Well, I suggest that this is a great opportunity to connect with them, to, to remind them how they can get the slides or get your ebook and capture some email addresses to gain engagement, uh, to say, hey, I'm going to stick around and answer some questions. If you're selling a book or a seminar, you're going to be over there. You say to them, great guys, this has been fantastic. I'll be over there to answer your questions. And so you use that last little bit to create more engagement online and real world so that you can do some great attraction and conversion into your business. Does this make sense to you guys? All right, so let's talk about, you know, how much you should be charging. Anybody, how much do you think you should be charging? I'm curious, for a one hour presentation, how much do you think you should charge? Oh, this is tough, right? You're gonna see, oh, oh some good answers. Interesting. 
Ah, Suze, I totally understand that. You, 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 but I'll tell you something, you are charging something. You're paying you. In essence, you, you, you should be getting, if you think about it, a commission because you're selling something. So you are being paid, just not a fee up front. It's a good answer. 2,000, 1,000, 5,000, 7,000. All right. So here's what I want you to know. Whatever amount you think you should be charging, it probably should be higher. All I want you to think about is, let's say you're charging $5,000, which is a, a, a number much higher than many of you have written, okay? I, then I want you to think about this. Imagine that there were a thousand people in the audience. How much value would you have to give each person in order to justify $5,000? $5. Can you give them $5 of value in an hour? How much value can you give them individually in an hour? Can you give them $1,000 worth of value in an hour? Because if you can, then you only need 10 people in the audience to justify $10,000. Like we have to think in terms of the value that you're creating for people, not your self-worth of what you think per hour is. It blew me away the first time. I remember standing on stage once and I, 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 I made something like $50,000 in three hours on stage years and years ago, the first time it ever happened. I was like, oh my God, my self-esteem had a hard time with that. Like I didn't, my self-worth, I couldn't believe. But then you have to realize, when you're on stage, it's not about your dollar per hour. It's about the life experience that went into creating the information that you're sharing with them during that hour. It's about the training that you went through. It's about the investment you made in yourself. It's about the energy you poured into it. It's not just about the hour you spent with them. It's about the value they're going to get from it. And so, I want, you to, I want you to think about the value the audience is getting. I want you to think about the value that the audience is getting. And... I want you to know that when you're first starting out, that might be difficult. I saw some of you going $100. I would rather you did it for free than charge $100. Again, it depends on the audience. But what I would rather you do is recognize that these days, especially in, in the North American market, the European market's a little bit different, but in the North American market, if you're charging anything less than five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000, nobody will book you anyway. They just won't. It's like if somebody told you, and I've got this car you can have, it's $400. Do you wanna buy that car? No. You don't want to buy that car. And so they feel the same way if you're too cheap as a speaker. They don't want that. And so, so what I'd rather you do is I'd rather you think about what your price should be. And then when a company says, well, you know, what's your price? And you're not confident with that price yet. You can say, you know what? This is my first time speaking for your organization. I'm willing to discount it or waive my fee. But then you send them an invoice for the fee with a discount for the fee because you want to get it in your mind that you are worth that fee. You wanna get it in their mind that you're worth that fee. And so you went and spoke there, you invoiced them $5,000, you discounted it by $5,000, that's fine. But a year later when they're like, you know what, we should get that person back. How much were they? They were $5,000. They gave us a really special deal last time, right? It, it, you, you start off by creating, you start off by creating the sense in yourself of the value. I, and I, I really want you to know that it is not about how much you are earning per hour. It's about how much you are giving to how many people per hour. And so when you're standing in front of a, a hundred people for an hour, if you're giving them ideas that are worth a hundred dollars per person, then that's $10,000 for that hour. I hope that that makes sense to you. Now, there are plenty of reasons for speaking for free. Plenty of them. I speak for free frequently. I don't build my business as a keynote speaker. I do all kinds of speaking for free. Why? Well, let's go back several slides to strategic outcomes. And so when you get really clear about what your strategic outcomes are for any given talk, then it no longer necessarily has to be about the money. One of my things is I am really clear that when I get invited to speak in a country for the very first time, I know that if there's enough people in the audience that that first time is going to create the reverberations and it would get me invited back to that, speak, that, that country again and again and again. The very first time I got invited to speak in Norway, I spoke for free. I since made hundreds of thousands of dollars speaking in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and what have you, because I did that first talk for free. Does this make sense to you all? So you, you get clear about what your strategic outcomes are, and then you determine, is this a premium talk that I should be making money on on the, uh, on the front end? Or is this a talk that has monetary value to me or social value to me way past any fees? And then you make a decision based on that. You're right. And then I ended up in the Netherlands. And funny enough, I ended up in the Netherlands as a result of that first talk in, in Norway. No kidding. All right. So 
what I want to get with you here is that, you know, the speaking industry is maybe the most exciting industry because, you know, like it's the one industry that's going to take a long time before they can replace you with AI. You know, there, there are a lot of industries where robots are coming along and speaking is this thing where it's you, it's your identity and, and it's your life experience. And it's, you, it's the shortcuts you're giving to people and the ideas and the value you're creating for them. And it's an opportunity to create the most phenomenal lifestyle where you get to work when you want, where you want, you get to meet the most incredible people. I, I am still blown away by the doors that speaking has opened for me. I, I, you know, I, I've, I've, I've spoken on stage with people that I once thought it would be impossible to ever get to meet. I, I'm sitting having breakfast with Richard Branson on Necker Island one day. Why? Because I got invited to speak at a conference there. I didn't even know he was going to be there. I walked upstairs. I'm having breakfast. There's Richard. I mean, yeah, that, that happened because I'm a speaker. I ended up touring, as many of you know, with Tony Robbins for a year and a half. Tony Robbins had a huge impact on me as a young man. So the opportunity to travel around the world with him and learn from him directly and speak on his stage, it was phenomenal. I've also had lots of other things happen, like one day getting invited to do a tour of a studio that used to be Industrial Light and Magic. For those of you who are not geeks like me, this is the original special effects studio that made the special effects for the Star Wars movies and Indiana Jones movies and all these kind of things. And I was there on a tour. And there I was on a tour. And I watched them, you know, I was a private tour. It wasn't like with a tour guide, it was a private tour. But I watched them do an investor's pitch because they were trying to raise a bunch of money for the studio. And afterward, I went up to the, to the guys and I'm like, because you know, the guy who, who's giving me the tour is a good friend of mine. And I said to him, wow, they're never going to raise money if they do it like that. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, they got to do this, 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 and this. And he, he said, do you mind if I tell them that? And I'm like, well, I'm just here on a tour. I don't really want to. And so he goes, no, 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 we should tell them. So they brought them over and they go, hey, this is my friend, Eric. And he has some ideas about the way you do your investor pitch. And, and so I gave them the ideas and they were like, holy cow, that really sounds good. They go, would you do the next pitch for us? I go, what? I'm here on a tour. I, what? And the next thing you know, I'm standing up on stage in the George Lucas Theater on the property where Photoshop and Pixar was invented, where THX Sound was invented, where Empire Strikes Back and Pirates of the Caribbean had their best. I mean, I'm standing giving a pitch to the investors. I'm on a tour. And then, and then the, one of the investors, he, at the end of my pitch, he goes, it's a very interesting opportunity. If we, uh, as a group, if we choose to invest in the studio, will Eric stay on and run the company? Guys, you might think I'm exaggerating. This is what happened. And what I'm saying to you is that when you become a really effective communicator, when you become really comfortable, what you can build for yourself is amazing. The flexibility and the freedom and the income potential is phenomenal. So what do we talk about? Hey, stories. It's all about stories. Being clear about your brand. You looked at your brand words. We talked about developing a set of strategic objectives for what you want to achieve when you're walking on a stage. If you can get clear about all of those things, then you can really get clear about how you start to put together a workshop or how you put together a one hour talk. And then of course, like we talked about, where are the organizations where you can start to get yourself known? Where are some of the places you can go to get yourself that initial stage experience? So does this sound good to you guys? All right. The, the, the real question is, okay, it's, let, let, let's get past, does it sound good? How many of you are actually willing to take action on these things? You've invested your time here. How many of you are actually going to do that? Take some action forward. Excellent. That's awesome. I, I say that because I know what it was like. I know what it was like to not be doing this and to make the decision one day, I'm going to do this. And if I could go back and tell me, you know, if I could go back and tell me what was going to happen as a result of that first step, the me of then would never believe it. There's no chance that I, the me of then would believe what I've been able to create from speaking ever since then. I, I, you know, I walk on stage in front of about 40 people in Stockholm the very first time I do a public presentation. And if I were to go up to that guy in a time machine right now and say, by the way, you know, you're going to end up sharing the stage with Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield and Ivan Meisner, Janet Atwood, Richard Branson, President Bill Clinton. You're going to travel all over the world and speak. You're going to be, people are going to pay for you to be at the front of the plane. I, I, th that kid would never have believed the majority of those things, certainly not all of them combined. And, and it, what that kid also wouldn't have believed is that one day I would be leading workshops of my own, getting to teach my stuff to people all over the world. I have taught in over 20 countries around the world. 
I, 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 you guys, not a single day goes by that somebody doesn't write to me and tell me about the impact I've had on their life. It just doesn't happen. If somebody's always writing about how Wildfoot has changed their life, how Business Freedom has changed their life, how the Speaking Academy has changed their life. That is one of the deepest privileges of my life. And what's really crazy is over the last two or three years, it's no longer writing to me. They stop me in airports or, as I told you, on the beach in Cancun or walking down the street in New York. I, I walked into Cafe Gratitude in San Diego and the waitress walked up to me. She goes, oh my God, I can't believe you're here. And I'm like, well, I, I come to Cafe Gratitude quite often. And she goes, no, no, no. I, I, I know you from YouTube. I mean, guys, it is a real privilege to be out there working your mission and having an impact on the world. And I would never have believed it. I'm super glad I believe just enough to take that first step. What it really, really comes down to is, hey, what did I do? I gathered a team around me. I, I, I gathered the right people around me. I went to the right training courses. I studied. I, 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 I watched videos on YouTube. I learned what was going on. But mostly what I did is I made sure that I had a really good network around me. And I'll tell you why I did that. How many of you guys are familiar with uh, Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra? Yeah. So I'll tell you that when I first started listening to Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra, they were already both quite famous, but nothing like they got to. And here's what I noticed is one day I'd be listening to Deepak Chopra and Deepak would be going, telling all these stories about Wayne Dyer. And then Wayne Dyer would be telling all these stories about Deepak Chopra. And I realized what they were doing was deifying each other. They were building each other's brand up together. I thought, oh my God, it's genius. It's genius. And so over the last several years, that's what I've been doing. I have a number of my friends. We've helped each other. We've built each other up. I mentioned them on stage. They mentioned me on stage. I mentioned them in a podcast. They mentioned me on a podcast. We get to learn skills from each other. We get to, uh, you know, we get to uh, propagate each other. We get to help each other get booked. And so having that incredible mastermind team around you of speakers is phenomenal. Now, one of the challenges these days is where do you find all these people? And in my case, I was, you know, I was kind of lucky because I guess, you know, I'd, I'd, gotten involved in, um, I'd gotten involved in speaking for an organization in London called the S Group. And if any of you are based in London or travel through London, I highly recommend that you check out the S Group. It's just a personal development club. Think, you know, Toastmasters meets Tony Robbins kind of a thing. You know, they have all these great speakers come in and they've been going for like decades. And, and, and because of that, I started putting together a bit of a mastermind of people that were interested in coaching and speaking, that sort of stuff. And so I, I highly recommend doing that. And what we started doing is we'd have people coming through our speaking academy and they were like, I really would like to keep a connection with everybody. And so what I started doing is offering like a little bit of post, you know, post workshop uh, coaching sessions and that kind of stuff. And this year we decided to take it out much more formally and create a mastermind for you to create a, uh, the, the, a, a proper speaking academy mastermind that is not like, you know, it's not a six month program. It is an ongoing, you know, we've already got like, you know, a, a couple of years worth of content pre-planned for you guys so that we can really help each other build up our brands. You helping me, me helping you, we helping each other. Does that sound good? That's what it's all about. So the way the speaking academy mastermind works and, and we, we, it's, it's not like Ted, it's Sam, it's different. So the way the mastermind works is that it's designed um, for people who really want to build, what I would like to say is, let's call it a professional speaking brand. And by professional, I mean anything from I'm earning money doing it, I'm selling my books doing it, I'm selling my training programs doing it, I'm running for political office, I'm, I'm, I'm campaigning in, in, uh, you know, for, for some form of social justice, I'm out there uh, speaking on behalf of the environment. If it is a major purpose for you, then that's what Sam is all about, is helping people really get clear about what their voice is and getting it out there to the world together. Um, the, the, if, so if you're, if you're interested in that kind of like, Hey, I want to build my brand and my business and I want to collaborate with other people that are doing that. Uh, or if you're an entrepreneur that wants to incorporate speaking into your business, like that's been one of the big, big wake ups for me is that I, I, I often think how my first business would have gone if I'd been willing to go out and speak at conferences and stuff the way I do now. I, I, I sometimes cringe at the, the money that I left on the table by not doing that in my IT company because I was too afraid. Um, and obviously, if you're, if you're already sort of minded in the realm of, hey, I'd like to spend more time with people that are, that are learning these same things that I can bounce off and that I can share content with and so forth, then, you know, we're ready. And obviously, here's a key thing. I am really clear about the kind of people that I want to be involved with in coaching and mastermind types environments. And that is um, people that really want to take action, that, that are ready, that are, that are past dreaming stage and ready to actually take even the first steps. And that's, that's key to me. 
Um, what I want to be really clear about is what this is not about. Uh, there are, and there are places to go and learn this. If, if, if this is simply about fame and fortune and money, there are speaking training programs that are all about that. Go do them. Uh, that's not really what this were. I am, I, I believe that fame and fortune and money should be the side effect of the incredible social impact you're having. Does this make sense to you? And unfortunately, yes, there, there is the other way to do it. The other way to do it is to do this chasing fame, fortune, and money and whatever, and that's fine. But that's not the energy of the way this mastermind is going to work, which means that, um, yes, of course, we'll answer questions and share strategies with how to pra- uh, maximize your profitability. And one of the core questions that's going to be asked anytime that stuff comes in, in is, are you providing value to justify that? Are you creating an impact to justify that? I really do believe that fame, fortune, recognition, money, and that stuff is the side effect of having a major impact. And so that's what this really is about. The way the program works is that every month you'll get access to live uh, virtual training workshops. So every single month, there'll be live workshops that you can go to um, and learn from experts in their field. Uh, You will have um, industry professionals teaching you key things. Sometimes it'll be, uh, you know, like top speakers teaching you tips about what to do on stage. The next time it'll be somebody teaching you business building practices, how to, uh, you know, how to, how to use LinkedIn as a professional speaker. There are key things to do on LinkedIn to really make LinkedIn work for you and help you get booked. So every single uh, month there will be key masterclasses that you'll be learning to really help you take your speaking career forward. And every single quarter we will have live Q and A sessions that I personally host. I'll host some of the the class as well. The live Q and A's are always with me and they're unrestricted. You come and you go, Eric, this is what happened to me. I need to know how to deal with it. Or I've got this event coming up. What's your advice on how to make it happen? And sometimes what we'll do during those Q and A's is we'll put people in like a hot seat, you know, where say, oh, like Chris, Chris will come along and go, Chris, Eric, I've got this situation coming up. We'll go, okay, guys, this sounds like a hot seat situation. And so then I'll work through that process with Chris, with all of us coming up with ideas of how he should brand this or what he should do there and so on. So it'll be super, super powerful stuff. Uh, as an example, you can kind of see, I think we've got an example of what the next like uh, two years or 18 months worth of master classes are about that are included in the program. Um, just to give you an idea, like, uh, um, in, uh, like in March, the, the workshop in March is exactly how to go about building a story journal. Some of you have been to my speaking academy and you've kind of gone through this with me. This will be a lot more detail where we spend uh, like an hour going through how to create your, your story journal, figuring out how to do the tagging. But here's the big thing I want to show you during that masterclass is how you integrate it with things like OneNote and Evernote so that it becomes an automated system. It makes it a lot easier to capture your stories, but also a lot easier to to collect them and sort them. For example, there's a feature in Evernote that when you upload your stories, when you save them in there and you start like preparing a talk and we'll show you how to do this, but you start preparing a talk, Evernote will actually remind you which of your stories might match that talk. There's some really, really cool stuff. It starts with having a story journal, but we're going to go through how to teach you some of these tips and tricks. Um, I I mentioned LinkedIn in July. We're going to have an entire workshop on how you build your LinkedIn um, profile. I mean, you can take some shortcuts now. Go look at mine. But more than that, there's some specific things about the way you message yourself on LinkedIn that can help you get booked and rebooked. Um, What else is there? There's uh, we're going to have an Instagram workshop. We're going to be talking about how to get yourself booked. Um, you can see through there, there's a bunch of different um, uh, podcasting. You know, many, how many of you guys want to launch a podcast? Okay, how many of you have no idea how to launch one, but it would be really cool to have one? <laughs> right, well, we're going to have a podcast expert that's going to come in and walk us through that entire process because that's one of the projects that I'm working on this year. And uh, so we're definitely going to be... Um, uh, we're definitely going to be doing that. And the, as I said, this is not, uh, you know, this is a... Uh, an ongoing mentorship. So it, 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 it lasts for as long as you want to help, want our help continuing to build your career as a speaker. Um, we're really, what we're really trying to do is to provide you with some of the shortcuts that I didn't have starting off. Um, and, and that means, you know, specific skills. It means strategies that work. It means some specific resources, uh, you know, certain types of documents and stuff that'll make things easier for you. What makes it great is that rather than it being a massive expenditure, like coming out, some of you should absolutely, by the way, how many of you have been to the speaking Academy? How many of you have been there? And, and like on a scale of like, you know, zero to 10, how strongly do you think people should go to the live speaking Academy one day? I'm curious. All right. looks like 
10, except for Lucas who says it's like 50. But what I want to get at is absolutely that you, you should come out and do that one day. But what we wanted to do is create something that was at a price point that was a lot more manageable so we could reach a lot more people. So yes, you should come out and do the live program one day. And what we want to do is create this. It's more convenient, more cost effective. Um, it also creates a sense of community and accountability. When you do an intensive program for you know, a week, that's great. When you've got a team operating with you for years to come, that's a whole different, uh, that's a whole different thing. And of course, what you're gonna get the benefit of is I have an incredible network of amazing people that are gonna come and teach some phenomenal things. So that's really gonna help a great deal. And it's gonna be fun. Uh, many of you know that we're working on the launch of um, Speaker Nation and to a large degree, you guys are going to have the inside track into how that all happens. And that is going to lead to you guys having like live events that you guys can be involved in getting together and having meetups and stuff. So it's going to be a super fun thing. So the question is at this stage, really truly, are you into like spending the next year or two really refining yourself as a speaker and making the investment that needs to happen to make that happen? When we launch this program uh, in the future, we're gonna be doing it super low entry level. It's only gonna be 247 per month. And, um, and I, you know, as you can see, that is so much less, less expensive than coming out and doing one of our intensive programs. What we're gonna do for you guys launching it here is it's only gonna be 197 per month, but I'm gonna give you two like kind of massive incentives to say, join me now. The one is this. This program, as we add more and more libraries, um, like what'll happen is that every masterclass that we do is gonna get saved so that when people join in the future, they're gonna have access to them. And we're gonna have bonus masterclasses and additional content that's gonna keep getting added. So the value of this mastermind is gonna go up over time. But for those of you who join us now as founders, as we're beginning, your price will be 197 forever. So it doesn't matter how much the price goes up next year, you guys will always have it at 197. And we're going to give you guys totally free something that we've been developing for quite some time. And I think you're going to love it. And we're going to give it to you for free as a bonus. It's a, it's the Sam speakers toolkit. And this is stuff that people have been asking me for, for years. And finally we got off our butts and we're, we've been putting this stuff together for you, but it means we're going to give you a, um, a, a social media quick tips list, which is really here are the key minimum things you need to do on social media to bump up your professionalism as a speaker. Then we're going to give you, and this is gold. I, I can't tell you what it would cost you to go get this stuff from a lawyer, but you're going to get um, done for you templates, uh, speaker agreements and contracts that you're going to want to use when you go get yourself booked as a speaker. I will tell you that if you're going to get a half decent lawyer to go construct these things for you, you're talking fairly serious expense each time. So we're going to give you the templates that we've created over the years that we use as part of your speaker's kit. We're also going to give you a template for how to write a really great introduction script. Um, for those of you who've been to the Speak Academy, you know, I go on about this. Like the first impression you make is what the person reads about you before you walk on stage. And I've heard some terrible ones. I'm talking at really high level conferences. I've heard some dreadful introductions. And so we're going to give you some templates around how to create the ultimate introduction script for you. And I believe that one of the master classes is also going to be on how to perfect your introduction script as well. Um, and then we're also going to give you some uh, sample emails that you use for getting yourself booked, for doing your price negotiations, for doing follow up, for getting rebooked and all that kind of stuff. So a, a really nice toolkit for getting yourself launched as a speaker. So if you get yourself registered today, you're going to lock the price in, you're going to get the speaker's toolkit and we're going to leave that um, I think you guys have access to this replay for about 48 hours and the opportunity to register at that price and get that bonus uh, lasts until February 18th because we've got some other campaigns going on to bring in some founder members. So again, 197 per month, you get the monthly uh, uh, speaker workshops, you get the uh, new content, like every single month, we're going to be adding more and more stuff to it. Um, you get, uh, you, and if you miss any of the master classes, remember they're loaded in, you keep them. So uh, you keep them for as long as you remember. You can always go back and use them as a resource. There's also a private Facebook group just for the SAM group where you get to collaborate, you get to upload your videos, get feedback on your talks and really like co-collaborate. And um, matter of fact, in one of our early, we did a, a mini SAM group with, with a group of our uh, uh, Speaking Academy clients and it was an all women class and they put on an event in Prague and it was awesome. They put on this great event where they, and, and they, you know, they use the SAM process to help them make that happen. So I, I absolutely am sure that that will happen within our SAM group here. And of course you also get the, uh, the, this, the toolkit. And please remember you, 
as a founding member, you guys will lock your price in. So as, as the program becomes deeper and deeper and deeper and has more value to it, uh, you will pay 197 for as long as you want to be a member. So get out there, get yourself registered, join the masterclass, get yourself introduced in the Facebook group and let's begin the journey together. It's going to be super fun. Here's what I want you to do as we get ready to do q and I need a moment to get myself ready for Q&A. So this is a good moment for you to go and check out the page to get yourself registered. And it is also a good moment for you to just think a little bit. Because I know that when something like this comes along, some of you are going, oh man, you know, Eric does these high value webinars and now he's selling us something. And very often I do webinars where I don't sell anything. And so I want you to think about something. First of all, if you have any resistance to the idea that I'm selling something, think about that. Think about this. I, I'm going to guess that we gave you more value in this workshop than we're asking you to spend in month one. So I am absolutely clean in making an offer to you. But the other thing I want you to think about, and I want you to think about this from the context of your workshops. When somebody resists, when they don't take action, there's only two reasons. They either have a lack of faith in you or they have a lack of faith in themselves to apply the product. Isn't it true? If, if you're selling a workshop or a product or a consulting service, the only reason they wouldn't buy is because they have a lack of faith in you to deliver value beyond what you're asking them to pay, or they have a lack of faith in themselves to actually take action. And so if you are really committed to becoming a speaker and you're finding yourself resisting the idea of joining the, 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 the SAM program, I want you to think about that. Is it me or is it you that you're having that lack of faith in? I will make you this commitment. I will do my very best to take responsibility for both. I will. I will provide you the absolute best, most engaging, highest value content that I can so that you absolutely don't have to have worry about whether you have faith in me. And then what I'll do is I'll create an environment that will hold you accountable and do the very best that I can to make sure that you fully take action, that you really take action on the stuff that you determine and make, and make things happen. And, and I will do my very best to help you with that side of it, as will the entire team. That is my commitment to you to try to overcome those resistances. So I am hoping that you'll join the SAM program. I want you to take about a minute right now. By the way, Laura, I get that. I totally get that. And, and I, it, it, Laura says, hey, it's my bank account that I don't have a great deal of faith in right now. That's why, by the way, up until two weeks ago, this program was going to be based on an annual enrollment only. That's true. You can ask my team. Kelsey's right there. Kelsey, was it not being? Yes, it was going to be on an annual enrollment only and it was a whole lot more money. I went back to the team and I said, guys, this program, it's, it's not about maximization of profitability. This is a program that is part of our overall strategic objectives to help people get their messages out there. We need to make it possible. And so we turned it into a monthly program and reduced the price dramatically as well. Now, here's the kicker. Laura, I would put to you that at the price point that we're creating it, I want to suggest to you that it is absolutely possible that in month one, if you simply apply some of the things that we talked about in this workshop, that 250, 247 or whatever the price, I can't even remember. I think it's so lowered in the past that, but that that is a ROI that you can create within 30 days. That's why we did it this way. We made it as easy as, congratulations, Sue. We made it as absolutely easy as possible. <laughs> Thank you very much for reminding the price. In fact, it was not even 247, it's 197. So there you go. Um, all right. Excellent guys. Take a moment. I'm just getting ready to do the Q and a while my team's up there. And here's what I'd love is either just take a moment and think a little bit about what you want to achieve over the next year. If you're going to work with us and, um, or what I'd like you to do is to even share in the chat and say, Hey, you know what? The, I want to hear more about your guys's why. Cause I saw some really phenomenal ones. So, but I want you to think about it a little differently. Because I'm hoping that right now you have slightly more belief in your why than you did an hour ago. I'm hoping you do. And what I want to do is I want you to know that I want to improve your belief in yourself a little bit every single month for the next year or two or three. And, and, and so by doing that with you, I want you to think from this position, if you've made the decision to join up with us or if you are thinking about that, what would you need to achieve over the next year or two to make you know that you had made the right decision? Give some thought to that. Share in the chat. I'm going through the questions right now. I'll put on a little bit of music for about 60 seconds, and then I'll be back with the live Q&A.
All right. Okay, I've got my Q&A here. So I've got some questions, some that were sent before the class began and some that were sent through the chat. And then also, I'm totally happy. In fact, the questions I really truthfully enjoy the most are the ones that come from you guys live in the interaction. So let's jump in and, 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 uh, and do that. So I'll start with some of the pre-programmed questions. But in the meantime, if you have a question that you want to ask live on camera, by the way, that would be practicing your public speaking. I would approve of that. Then go ahead and press the electronic hand raising feature in Zoom, and then I'll come and find you. So the first question I've got here is from Michelle Templeton. Uh, what order should you do the speaking program? What would you do? Would you do this first? Or okay, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer any questions about Sam or the Speaking Academy in a separate Facebook Live. I don't, I've given you guys enough of a sales pitch. Right now, I wanna answer your questions about speaking. So if you've got questions about Sam or you've got questions about Speaking Academy, send them through, or I might stick around a little after and do them, but I, I wanna deliver on the promise to answer questions about speaking. Is that fair? So Michelle, I will get to your question. I just don't wanna take time up doing it now. Uh, okay, um, sorry, <laughs> next question. Uh, Joanna, let's see here. All right, in the industry of proclaimed speaker, how do you make yourself stand out? Have you noticed a similar tendency within companies that have had bad experiences with past speakers? Um, so, you know, I think, um, I don't know, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name, is it Myri? Are you live with us? Can we find you? Yeah, there you are. I'm gonna unmute you if I can. I can. Hey. There we go. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm good. That's my question. Yeah, so you're saying um, it, when there's a ton of already like proclaimed speakers out there, how do you make yourself stand out? Um, and so here's, here's one of the things I want to point out is that you really don't want to be compared with any of the other speakers. Let me, let me be clear that when a company is um, trying to get speakers, especially in a corporate environment, it's not really, occasionally it's the speaker they're after because they have a perception about that speaker's level of fame or you know, that sort of thing. But the truth is what they're really after is the message, right? They're after the message. And so the way you make yourself stand out is by understanding what that organization is curious about, what they're interested in, what their pains are, and then you show them how your talk is going to solve those problems. And that becomes a far more compelling way to sell yourself than to try to sell yourself on brand alone when maybe you're not as proclaimed or as well known as other people. So for example, um, when I first started speaking in Estonia, I was doing my own private workshop, so I didn't have to worry about this stuff. But then I started getting invited to do some talks outside of my, my workshops, right? So, but then the question is, how does the promoter get me booked there, right? Like what is the key? And the key is to make sure that my talk and that the pitch is aligned to what that company is interested in at the moment. So um, I can't think, there's that big Swedish bank in Estonia, what's it called? Svetbank. What's that? Svetbank. That's the one. Shede. Yeah, that's the one. And so, you know, they've written a number of articles about me in Estonia, but you know what's really fascinating is, is that they wrote articles because those were topics they were already writing about. And what we managed to do is make sure that the talks were somewhat aligned to the topics they were interested in. And so it creates resonance. Now that they're getting some press coverage, there are companies that are going, hey, we could have you come in. And so I had a real estate company hire me for a private day to come in and do a day, a day of training, which is speaking for 30 people, right? Um, and had me come in. They, they, it didn't matter that they had not heard of me before. It mattered that my message resonated with the value they wanted. Does this make sense? It makes sense. But I have like a linked question. I also raised a hand about it that so... What I hear from you is that basically you adapt your speaking or your message to, uh, to the company or to the organization you're um, speaking for, right? But then yeah. also, like, but then how many topics can one person have? So if I'm going to be speaking on, I don't know, um, team management, then I speak on sustainability, then I speak on leadership, then isn't it going to get like messy for people? Like what is the thing that they should link me with? And that is actually what I'm struggling at the moment as I do have many topics in my portfolio and the topics I get paid for at the moment are not like the ones I do truly want to focus on. And then it gets tricky on how do I now, I already did this cool training, you paid for me, how do I now sell you the other thing I want to do as well? as well yeah so this is something that i've really wrestled with and and in in a, in a weird way i had a very clear plan about it and then you know if you want to make god laugh what you do is you tell her all about your plan right so you know here here was my plan 
my plan was that I knew I was going to write a wild fit health type book at some point and that I wanted to write about parenting and I had all these other things that I wanted to write about all based on my interest in evolutionary biology and psychology. But I knew from experience that when somebody becomes really well known in certain types of niche markets, they become uh, imprisoned by that niche. So mm -hmm. as a very good example, John Gray, who wrote the Mars Venus books is one of my you know, best friends. And, and you know, the, the, what's crazy is he's created one of the most incredible brands in the world, but when he wants to talk about other stuff, it's hard because people just want to hear about the same thing. Now, tell us more about Mars Venus. Tell us more about men and women, right? When he wants to be talking about the, the hormones and communication relative to what's going on around nutrition and, and supplements, and that kind of stuff, right? So I made a decision that I would build my brand as a business speaker first. Mm -hmm. And that as a business speaker, that would earn me the right to speak on lots of other topics. Now, what happened in my case was confusing. And that was that I started introducing WildFit to some of my business clients. And then WildFit accidentally outgrew Business Freedom. WildFit is a bigger business today than Business Freedom is. And that was an accident. I didn't mean for that to happen. So it creates a little bit of brand confusion. One of the ways we deal with that is, is that when I go to a new country, we make a decision about which brand I'm taking to that country first get known with that brand first and then with enough respect and with enough positive reputation that I can then use my foot in the door to bring up whatever topic I want. And so what I would think about is who are you at your core? What is your primary brand promise? Who are you? Then that is the pitch that you go in there with. So if you say, for example, you're a communications expert, well, there's a million topics you can talk about through being a communications expert. But once you've proven yourself to a company in that one area, and you can say, by the way, I also would like to come and speak about sustainability. They're like, oh, yeah, I mean, our people love you. Of course you can come and talk about sustainability. Does this make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. That's a great question. All right. Um, all right. Laura says, what if your talk doesn't come through on the promise? Okay. Laura, I don't like that question because it's just not supposed to happen. But I will tell you, it actually happened to me like recently. And I, this has never happened to me before. I have never not been one of the top rated speakers at any event that I've ever spoken at. Never has that happened to me. Never, 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 never until recently. And what happened was, is that I was booked to speak at a large conference. And then they asked me to come out and do a talk for their key leadership team prior to the conference. And I said, sure, what do you want me to speak about? And they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, whatever. And they really didn't give me much remit. So I thought what I would do is you know, I would speak about the power of communication and public speaking relative to their network so that they would see what value I was going to be presenting for their network next year. And I did the presentation. I got a huge applause. I had tons of people come up to me afterward and say what a great talk it was and ask for my advice about how to teach their people about this and so on. But then the organizer came to me after and they go, yeah, it, it just, that really wasn't what we were looking for. <laughs> I was crushed. I've never had anybody say that to me before. Never, never. And then weirdly, it happened again about two weeks later. Two weeks later, I had almost the exact same thing happen where I was invited to speak at a really prestigious event. I got on stage. I, I, it was a four day event. I got on stage after three other speakers who did great, but not very, or sorry, I got on stage after two other speakers that did great, but not super high energy talks, not lots of laughs, not lots of what we call IPMs, impacts per minute, good content, but not high engageability. I got on stage and here's what's crazy. The organizer said to me, Eric, we want you to get on stage and sell wild fit. And I said, you know, I've been to your guys' events before. I don't think that you sell. I don't think selling from your stage is, is culturally the right thing to do. I think what I should do is I should do a really high energy talk and create lots of excitement and, and add value. And then we can make an offer to them after the event. But I don't think selling on that stage is the right environment. She goes, okay, you're right. You do it that way. So I got on stage. I had uh, one of the highest IPM scores I've had. It was incredible. It, there were tons of laughter. I got a huge standing ovation. It was a phenomenal success from the audience point of view. Next day, I'm sitting down with the organizer and, and they go, yeah, it was a bit salesy. Can you imagine if I had sold? Like, you know, and so here's what I learned from both of these things. First of all, Laura, nine times out of 10, or in my case, two times out of two, that this has happened, it's because I haven't been clear enough with the producer about the outcomes they wanted. That's the truth of it. I, you know, when that woman told me, hey, you should sell, 
I should have had alarm bells because I knew that that's not what the organization wanted and I should have dug deeper into what the organization wanted. Does that make sense? And so then the next thing is, is the same thing happened at the other event. Is that like, I go, well, what do you want me to do at this preliminary talk? And they're like, I don't know. I, oh, well, then I shouldn't have gone on stage. If they don't know, then how am I supposed to know? So most of the time, if somebody fails to deliver, I would like to say that it's gonna be as a result of not being clear about what they were supposed to deliver. So you can solve this problem mostly by getting absolutely clear about what the organizer wants you to deliver. And remember something else, and you will hear me again and again over the course of the next year or two that we're together. You will hear me say this again and again. The audience is only ever the client when it's your workshop. Otherwise, the producer is the client. The audience is not the client, the producer is the client. So it doesn't matter necessarily what the audience wants, it matters what the producer wants. So the clearer you get about what the producer wants, the more likely it is that you deliver what it is that they wanted. Now, Laura, on the off chance that you go up and you have a lackluster performance, I, I would like to suggest that I'm never gonna let that happen to you, but let's say that it happens to you then what I want you to understand is that there is no such thing as failure as long as you have learned. And one of the key things that, again, you'll hear me say this all year long is you should record every single talk you do. I am not on stage ever anymore. That the talk, I mean, rarely, every now and again, it slipped through. But I'm telling you, 99% of the time that I am on stage, it's being recorded. Video preferably, but minimally audio every single time. Why? Because I come off stage every single time feeling like I should have done better. And if any of you have ever seen me on stage, I think I'm pretty good at what I do. I come off the stage every single time, beating myself up, knowing it could have been better. Now, I don't beat myself up harshly. I'm not mean to myself, but I immediately, I'm looking at the stuff that could have been better. The challenge is I don't wanna rely on my memory about what could have been better. I wanna to listen to the recording and break it down scientifically about how it could have been better. Does this make sense? Hey, who's this young up and coming female congressman? I can't think of her name right now. Uh, somebody know? She's kicking butt. She's getting all kinds of media, far left wing, Cortez. I was reading about her the other day. You know what she does at the end of every talk? She gets off stage with a notepad and she writes down every single thing that could have been better. You watch her. I don't care what you think about her politics. That's not the point of this. She's going to be fantastic. She already is. But the reason she is, is she comes off stage. She, they, she, I read this just now. I just yesterday read it in an article. She comes off stage, takes out her journal. And she goes, oh, that joke's better if I leave a bit of a pause here. That joke bomb, don't use it again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reason she's good is she is incrementally improving. And so, Laura, if you ever walk off stage and you didn't deliver property, properly, you should be celebrating your opportunity to learn how to never do that again. All right. Okay. Can I just ask just a little bit more about this? Like, yeah, go for it. Um, I don't have your so camera on. Anybody who's asking me questions, you got to have your camera on. It's not public speaking if I can't see you. <laughs> um, I'm not so concerned about the presentation not going well. It's that, I mean, when you were talking about meeting the producer's needs, basically, you know, like pro providing more gym or, um, increasing gym use and memberships or, uh, you know, long-term employees that are working more collaboratively, collaboratively with each other. Like what if they kind of say, this is what we want. And, and then I kind of go, Ooh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can meet those needs. I don't know if I got uh, the stories or the information to meet those needs. There are only two answers. There's only two. One, don't take the engagement. No, there's three answers. Don't take the engagement. Or the other one is take the engagement, but say to them, that's not what I'm here to deliver. In fact, this happened to a friend of mine, uh, Janet Atwood. She got booked to speak at a conference and they wanted her to speak about, she speaks about passion tests, right? And, and that's she, her best selling book is the passion test. And they wanted her to come and talk about passion tests for business, which is what her partner talks about. She said, look, I can't do the passion test for business, but I can do the passion test. But they wanted the passion test for business so badly that they got her to come anyway, right? And then they later said to her, well, that's not what we asked for. Well, it, I know both sides of the equation. One side, they're like, we were really clear we want a passion test for business. But she said she was really clear that she doesn't do that. And what I would say is she couldn't have been clear enough because she probably should have gone with option one. And that is just to say no. So that's the first thing. 
But better than saying no is you connect with your mastermind team and you say, hey guys, I've been asking this <laughs> They've asked me to figure out how to create more employee engagement and how to make sure that, and do you guys know of any exercises, any stories or any examples that I can use that might help me achieve those goals? And then your mastermind's going to team is going to come along and say, yeah, do this, do that, do this. And you're going to put the talk together. And so you won't have to say no. Okay. All right. Uh, next I've got, um, Okay, uh, Phyllis says, what are, the, um, uh, what are the legalities around using other people's photos and music in presentations like the BFSA, uh, uh, like the BSA, BFSA video, the Speaking Academy video? So um, generally speaking, you'll need to check this country by country, uh, um, hotel by, or, or, most conference centers pay for um, music licenses so that they can have live music in their conference centers. Um, so you generally don't have that as a problem, but if you try to live stream your events and you're using music in your events, then YouTube or Facebook will cut your stream off if they hear you're using content that you haven't acquired a license for. So you do need to be a little bit cautious about that. Uh, slides, um, you know, I see people all the time using slides with images that are not their own. Uh, you know what, most of us are not big enough speakers in the world that that's going to cause any kind of a problem. Uh, that said, for what it's worth, it's not that expensive to buy the rights to a picture and use the picture properly or to go and take the damn picture yourself and use one of your own. So I, I am, I'm really a fan of artists getting recognition. I mean, would you want somebody using your talk without your permission? So I don't think you'd want that happening. So maybe you shouldn't use their picture without their permission. And I'll tell you one other thing that's really crazy. I see people using a slide where they took this picture and you can see the Shutterstock watermark on their slide that they haven't, that they're, I mean, what? That just makes you look super unprofessional. And the weirdest thing is I've seen so super professional speakers doing that. Never make that mistake. Either buy the picture or find another one, but do not use the one that's watermarked like that. So good question. Um, okay, this question I've already kind of answered also from Phyllis is, um, we aren't supposed to write our talks word for word or memorize our stories. No, we are not. For all the reasons that I already said in the main part of the master class. You just need to remember the, the, the story itself and don't try to memorize the words. Uh, that said, if you're writing a book, yeah, you can have your talks transcribed, but bear in mind, they're gonna need to be edited into written form because written English or written Norwegian or written Swedish or written Russian is different than the spoken versions of all those languages. And so that's, you know, that's something you need to keep in mind if you're gonna use transcriptions. Uh, Suze says, uh, this is again, um, similar to a question that came up earlier, but can you speak on multiple topics or stick to one? I've been sticking to one so far, but I'm thinking of incorporating a second one. My view is this, get really known for a topic and deliver so much value in that niche that people become curious about who you are as a person and then have them pull the other topics out of you. That's really what happened to me. I, I became really proficient and, and you know, solid as a business speaker. And I could speak in front of any size audience and I could entertain them and get the highest ratings and all that kind of stuff. But then in Q&A, people would always ask me how I could do 10 or 12 hours on stage and I don't do jet lag and I'm healthy and blah, 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 blah. And I go, well, you know what? Sure, let me share a few points with you about food. And you know where that led. And for those of you who don't know where that led, that led to me doing a one hour bonus session at our speaking academy or at our business freedom experience. And that led to me creating a small coaching program for eight people. And that led to thousands of people in 20 countries around the world, completely transforming their health. Right? So now I'm a business speaker and health speaker, but you know, what else happens is now people have gone through WildFit, and you know, where wild fit's so different than most diet and nutrition programs out there is that it really truly works. And, and, and so then people are curious and they're like, wow, well, Eric, you know, you mentioned you went and spent time with the Hadza Bushmen, you know, uh, can you tell me, did you learn anything about parenting from them? Well, as it turns out, I did. And so the other topics that I like to talk about start getting pulled out of me because I created so much value at the first talk. So Suze, that's roughly my view of that. I hope it helps. Uh, Rusty. Uh, uh, okay be on stages beyond my own province in the next year and be able to let my clients go to some other hungry freelancer. That's not um, the question. That's not the question. That's not the question? No, I, below further is the question. I okay. have a one sheet that I created. 
Yep. And the one sheet, I used some examples that I found, and I'm quite pleased with it. I wonder if you can see it if I put it up visually here. It's 11 o'clock. And so uh, in there it says most requested presentations, but that feels dishonest. So do you have an idea for any of us just starting out what other kind of wording we can use there? And then on the back page, it says what others are saying. And I need to go give my red feminist pill talk somewhere so that I can get somebody saying something similar to what you said so I can say a quote there, but what they're saying about that okay. talk. Rusty, I, I, you know, this is an interesting thing. First of all, could you give us uh, 60 seconds on your message? Give us all six, turn your camera on. Okay, it's on, give us I, I see myself on screen. Oh, can you? I can't see you for some reason. I don't know why. I'm in the top left on my board, but it's probably different on yours. I'm here. Okay, there you are. I see you now. Okay, okay. give us 60 seconds on your topic. Okay, 60 seconds. The passion. Give me some passion. <laughs> I have swallowed the red pill of feminism, and it is not an option when you have sons. I hurt my son badly. And thankfully, I can say that I've repaired that relationship by finding a more humanist way to walk about in the world. All right. Uh, could you guys give me some comments? Uh, comments on Rusty's energy, on her passion, on her presentation. Just give me some just quick comments on that 30 second uh, uh, burst in the chat. Go for it now. Okay. So Rusty, I want you to save all of those. And in the section of your paper, it says what people say. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I'm, I'm kind of kidding around a little bit, but what I'm getting at is that, you know, you've just, you know, that's what a mastermind is about. My, the very first testimonials I got from, from stuff were from mastermind groups. So I go, go to my buddy and go, hey, I'm doing a talk and I have a quote from you. You know, when the, one of the first kind of famous people that gave me a quote was Chet Holmes. Why? Because I asked him for one. I went to Chet and I said, Chet, can I have a quote from you? He goes, he goes yeah, write what you want and I'll put my name on it. So I, ra I drafted something. He edited it a little bit for me. He sent it back to me. When you're looking for that kind of stuff, ask your network. This is one of the reasons that having a powerful mastermind is important. You listen, here, by the way, here are some things that people said about you, just, just in case you're, um, let me see here. Uh, we're awesome, warm smile, pretty good, honesty, deep, honest, raw, want to hear more, powerful. Thank you, Rusty. That was honest, passionate, honest, authentic. See what I'm talking about? And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating right now, but imagine in your mastermind that you upload a video into the Facebook group and go, guys, I'm looking for some comments on this. I'm looking for some comments that I could use. And by the way, guys, listen to me very carefully. Jack Canfield, very, very good friend of mine, might have been the most successful author in the history of books, maybe. I mean, I don't know what title's more popular than Chicken Soup. There's so many of them, right? If you go to the bookstore, you will find countless books that go, Jack Canfield has this quote on the back of the book. I said, Jack, why do you, you're, you're like, you give recommendations for all these books. And he goes, you know what? At the end of the day, I support anybody who wants to write a book and get it out there. And plus it means my name is the most commonly name used, I'm a common name in the entire bookstore. And so if somebody says to you, hey, can I have a promotional quote from you? You, if, as, as long as you can, as long as you believe in them, give them the promotional quote. So if guys, if Rusty were to upload a, a video into the Facebook group and told you she was looking for some promotional quotes for what people say about me, how many of you guys would be willing to give her a promotional quote that she could use? All right, Rusty, your question has been answered, I hope, to your satisfaction. All right. Uh, I have um, come to the end of Q&A, to the scheduled Q&A time, um, but I feel like I haven't answered that. Like I can see there's a whole realm of questions and the trouble is Unfortunately, I have a hard stop because I have an interview I have to get to so what I will do is I will see about doing a Facebook live to answer all of these questions that I'll dump into the Facebook group. Does that sound fair? Cool uh, guys, I, I hope has this been good for you? Excellent. I'm glad. It's been super fun for me as well. I know that I will get to spend uh, the next year working with many. I know some of you were already in the SAM program before you even came to this masterclass. I'm super excited for you. For those of you who joined now, super congratulations. I'm really glad that we get to spend the next year or two or three together really taking some powerful messages out into the world. Um, I want to leave you with this just general thought, and, and that is that real change in the world is needed right now. I can give you a countless, huge, massive list of areas where change is needed, but there is social change that is needed. There is political change that is needed. There is environmental change that is needed. 
There are human rights changes that are needed. There are food production changes that are needed. There are legislation changes that are needed. And what I want you to know is that you can make some of that change. You absolutely can. And it, it doesn't feel like that before it starts happening, but it's very much like summiting a mountain. It just takes one step at a time, one step at a time. And every now and again, you need to turn around and look backwards to see how far you've come because the goal still seems so far away. But you absolutely can have a massive impact in the world and it needs it right now. This is my biggest reason for enjoying teaching people how to communicate effectively because when you teach the right people to say the right things, then the right things begin to happen around the world. So uh, whether you're joining us for Sam or not, I hope you'll apply these things uh, powerfully into the future. I hope that we get to meet live and in person one of these days really soon. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to share this with you. Thank you guys so much for your engagement, your commitment, and congratulations to all of you who are going to be joining us for the next year uh, or more on the SAM program. Well done, everybody. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Hi. Bye. 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 И берешь пять долларов. Почему ты так сколько ты должен выбрать? Finished winning a master. Oh, you know, Eric just goes. I'm still like, unmuted. Hyvät, hyvät, kun kuuntelemaan tämän, tämän tätä uudestaan, mutta oli paljon matkalla sellaisia alueita, jossa, jossa tätä yhteys Hey Warren, Rusty. Peter, call me. Hey Michelle. Oh, hey, Ryan. hey Sharon, Ritpa, Warren, Marcus. <laughs> Amish, Ruth, Gavin.
We're talking to anybody right now, and and we've got a hell of a good calling card. I made a big list this morning from my all my LinkedIn contacts. Can you hear me okay? So I was so hi to everyone. I was going to tackle all of those this afternoon and just go, hey, do you know any brands that can benefit from being on an A and E network in North America? And just what a cutie. Investor. Yeah, that too. I mean, they have the advantage of co-owning the show and the IP with, I'm just practicing my pitch, but it's, it's you know, we're with uh, the co-creator of Hell's Kitchen and uh, Warrior. I mean, it's a fucking pretty powerful brand. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you so much for joining. We're going to be closing the Zoom line now. I hope you have a wonderful day. Sure. I am. Uh, let's do it. Bye. We're on the same exact page. I'm on the treadmill, so you're going to be puffing and puffing.